Awesome, thank you. Everyone can see okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, my name is Eddie Shelton. Um, I'm with the Virginia Department of Labor and Industry. Um, I've been with consultation since last May. Um, for those of you who maybe don't know what consultation is or haven't really worked with consultation, what we do is we provide um, an on-facility, uh, kind of a walkthrough of your organization. We look at your programs. We can provide air and noise monitoring. Um, and we do hazard recognition as well as uh, different kinds of training for your employees. Um, the only obligation the employee has to us is that they correct the hazards we find. Um, our services are provided by, uh, by grants and taxes by the federal and state government. Um, therefore, whatever we do find is completely free to the employer. Um, we don't issue any kind of penalties, no citations. Like I said, the only thing we do is we find hazards and ask that the employer fixes them. Um, if anybody's kind of interested in our, uh, in our service, um, we have uh, information up front. But um, I also have my card up front. If anyone has any questions or would like us to kind of talk about what we can do for your company, uh, please give me a call at any time. I'm more than happy to help you all out. Um, that being said, we're going to kind of go into, uh, into machine guarding, kind of a general overview. Um, this picture right here is from the Industrial Revolution. If any of you all have any facilities that look like that, please give me a call so we can kind of make some corrections. Because <laughs> um, stuff's changed a lot in the past 100 years or so. so. Um, these right here, um, from 2014, these are the most frequently cited serious violations um, by enforcement officers um, in the United States. As you can see, machine guarding is the second highest um, cited violation. And there were almost, one, or almost 1,600 um, different violations in the, the U.S. So that's, uh, that's a pretty, pretty big number. It's one of the big reasons why R. Donnelly has decided to put this on because it's a, it's, it's a major issue out there. Um, of that, as you can see, one of the biggest single issues out there is the grinders. Um, I've seen that on just about every job site I go on, so that's something to kind of keep in mind. Um, as well as your point of operations on your machine guards um, and different kinds of pulleys and whatnot. Okay, so just to kind of give you guys an idea of kind of how the whole process works. Um, in 2013, um, inspectors did an inspection on a company um, that had seven willful violations and three repeats for machine guarding. Um, does anyone want to take a guess on what the proposed fines were for this company? Two hundred thirty-five thousand. The actual proposed fines was almost six hundred thousand um, dollars. So that's kind of a, a big, a, a big thing to kind of look at in your operation. If you guys know there's a machine guarding issue, um, it's a big thing to take care of because that's where a lot of, um, a lot of fatalities and injuries happen in the United States. So, um, anyone want to take a guess on how many injuries there were per year for machine guarding? On average, for anything from little cuts on the fingers to getting trapped in um, different kinds of machinery, it was uh, 57,000 injuries happen annually. Um, so it's, a, I mean, it's just something to think about. And um, one of the bigger issues there is the fatalities. I mean, you're looking at just shy of one person a day goes to work, leaves their family to make money for them, and doesn't come home. Um, so more important than the $600,000 in fines, you got to look at the, the human element of that. you got to get your employees home at the end of the day. That's what this is all about. Um, and uh, thanks to Dustin Landers, wherever he's at, he was able to get this information for uh, Virginia only. There were 140 non-fatal instances where workers were, uh, were injured um, in machine guarding related uh, incidents. Um, of those, 50 required more than 31 days away from work, and the average was 14 days away from work. Um, I don't own a business, but I can imagine that the cost of losing an employee for a month or two weeks is a lot when it comes to production, when it comes to experience. So that's, that's something to kind of keep in mind is that it's not always a monetary cost. You're losing valuable experience. You know, if you had an employee who's been there for you know, 10, 15 years and you lose them for a month, that's a, that's a pretty, pretty good um, asset taken away from your company. Um, of those 140 instances, um, over half of them happened after the employer had been on the job for between 6 and 10 hours. Uh, so you kind of want to keep an eye on you know, making sure your employees come to work and that they don't kind of lose sight of what they're doing and take, kind of take things for granted. You want to make sure that they stay engaged in their operation and kind of understand um, that it's just as important in hour 10 as it was the first 30 minutes of their shift. Um, and so looking at all these costs, uh, after the cost of insurance, including your workers' compensation, um, retraining an employee, potentially having to rehire them, uh, facing potential uh, citations from the Virginia Department of Labor, or OSHA, whichever it may be, um, it's, it becomes more cost efficient just, just to guard the machinery uh, properly. It's, it's, it's so much cheaper to guard it than to pay out workers' comp and citations and retraining, reemployment. So just kind of you know, do it right the first time and you know, make it a lot, lot easier for you and your company and the employee themselves. 
Machine guarding accidents typically happen at the point of operation and then any part of the machine that moves, which could be you know belts, pulleys, uh, chains, sprockets, that kind of stuff. Um, and then in running nip points. Um, I'll kind of show what that is if you guys don't have an idea. I have a slide later on that kind of I can point it out a little better than explain it. Um, the overall goal of machine guarding is to prevent contact with the worker's body from any part of, from any hazardous moving part. That's not necessarily like the grinding wheel, for instance. That's if the grinding wheel were to explode um, because you're, you know, it's running at too high of an RPM. You want to protect the worker also from the shrapnel that can be, um, that can be created from an explosion of a wheel or something like that. So it's not just the, the part itself. Um, it also ensures that no objects can fall into the moving parts. You know, same thing as a grinder. You don't want a piece being able to fall into there and get shot back out at the employee. And uh, they should allow the employees to be able to do their jobs uh, efficiently and quickly. Um, it shouldn't really take away from the production of the company itself. Um, so as you saw earlier, the grinders were, one of the big issues with grinders were the tongue guards and the bench rests. Um, and right there, the, uh, the adjustable tongue guard, as you can see, I don't have a pointer, um, should never be less than one quarter inch. Um, that's, that's, that's something I see a lot in my, uh, in my inspections. So that's something, you know, maybe you want to check, you know, weekly, make sure it's not being grinded down. Just, you know, real quick, five second check you can do and um, kind of get yourself out of that. Your bench rest is never more than one eighth of an inch. Um, same kind of deal, it should be adjustable, so there's, you know, should be no issue with that. Um, also one of the issues we see is that the wheel speed uh, of the actual grinding wheel, you need to make sure that they're rated properly. If the grinder itself is going to spin that wheel at 8,000 RPM, but your wheel is only rated for 6,000, um, you're going to have an issue there because you're spinning the wheel faster than what it was designed to do, and that creates a hazard to the employee. Um, so there's a... Uh, Here's a situation that happened. There was a, a worker who was working at a foundry in Milwaukee. Push the wrong button. Disregard. Um, on the grinding wheel, uh, the grinder exploded and it shot out fragments um, that hit the employee um, and uh, basically it struck the employee. What, it, what eventually caused the incident was that, like I said earlier, the, uh, the wheel that was mounted onto the grinder was actually spinning at a faster uh, rate than what it was designed to do and it actually exploded and ended up killing that worker. Um, that's, you know, that's eventually you know, someone going to work, you know, trying to supply money for their family, make a good living for themselves, who didn't come home at the end of the day because someone installed the wrong grinder. Um, so that can be kind of be fixed with, uh, with proper guarding and you know, ensuring proper um, placement of, of the material. So there are different types of guarding. Um, the, and it should be able to provide protection to the operator and other employees in the area. Um, and those, like I said earlier, those can be created by the point of operation, um, in running nip points, rotating parts, and uh, your flying chips and sparks. Your, okay, your general requirements for machine guarding, the, if possible, the guards need to be affixed to the actual machinery itself in which you're, you're working with. If that is not possible, um, then they need to be secured elsewhere um, to ensure that entrance into the point of operation of the machine is not possible. And then also the guard should be, should not offer a hazard in and of itself. You shouldn't put up an electric fence to keep employees out of an area. Um, so you got, you guys thoughts on this. If you guys have a power press and you guys are using hand tools to move objects in and out of that power press, does the hand tools in and of itself allow you to deviate from the, uh, from, from guarding? Right, it does not. Um, the reason is the letter of interpretation from 1976, it, it's, it's a little antiquated, but uh, the, like I said earlier, the purpose of the guarding itself is to protect the employee from moving parts, which includes explosions, you know, should the wheels come off or anything like that. Um, and hand tools itself is not going to protect an employee from flying parts. Um, this is some examples of, of, uh, of hand tools in which an employee could use, um, but they can only be used as a supplement to the guarding and not for guarding itself. Um, so there's different kinds of, of uh, machines that would require guarding. Uh, this is in no way a full representation, but this is a, these are commonly found machines that some of y'all I'm sure have in your facilities that, uh, that need to be guarded. Um, additionally, your uh, revolving drums and barrels need to be guarded by an enclosure, which is interlocked, which means that, uh, that unless that guard is connected and closed properly, those spinning barrels and drums cannot rotate while the employee has access to them. Um, this is an issue of anchoring. We see this a lot too, like on your, especially on your, uh, your floor grinders. 
where you have places where they can be anchored to the floor, um, you guys need to go ahead and make sure that they are anchored to, anchor to the floor to prevent that machine from moving while it's in operation. Um, so this is a, uh, a mechanical power, uh, I'm sorry, a mechanical or electric power control should be provided on each machine which makes it possible for the operator to cut off the power from the point in which they're working. Um, therefore, obviously with this one, the employee's works position should be in this area because they have access to the emergency stop. They shouldn't have to run around the machine in order to, to hit that emergency stop. Um, and then on different kinds of machines that you guys may have, if power it comes off of, or if power is turned off to the facility, you guys have a power outage or anything like that, once power does come back on, there needs to be a means to prevent that machine from restarting when power is returned back to your facility. Um, here's another situation. Um, a worker was uh, struck by a 40 pound uh, pump rotor that he was turning on a lathe. Um, it, it came out, it was, basically what happened was they had a plexiglass window that was, that was the guard. Um, that guard wasn't enough to contain the 40 pound piece that was turning on the lathe. Um, it ended up struck the worker and killed him. Um, so that's something you look at too. And uh, one of the big things that you kind of need to look at with, with that kind of stuff is to make sure that, which is on here later on, but the guards that you guys have in place, if you guys have fabricated them or bought them from a different supplier, the guards that you guys have should be of the same or better um, capability as what they were manufactured in. Um, a plexiglass is nice, you know, it allows you to be able to see into the operation. However, if it's not going to be able to stop whatever projectile is in there or the machine, then the guard does absolutely no good to the, to the operator themselves and you're putting them in, in the same position as not having a guard at all. Um, so in this one, um, a bell casting on a lathe came loose. Um, it struck the worker and uh, ended up killing them. As I said, they were using uh, the plexiglass viewing window and that once again wasn't enough to stop the projectile and that worker um, was subsequently killed. Um, what they found out was to obviously you know, ensure that the parts being machined are appropriate size and rotational speed for what's being, for what's being machined, what you're, what you're operating on. Um, and then to make sure that the vision panels are strong enough to contain the ejected parts. And as I said, um, you need to make sure that any replacement parts, they meet or exceed the manufacturer's original design. So we're going to compacting and bailing equipment. Um, the hazards involved with this is that workers can be crushed by the ram motion. Um, and that typically comes from a, uh, a guard being bypassed or a lockout tagout procedures not being followed. I've actually seen this in my area where a worker was actually working in one of these kind of things. Um, and they had lockout tagout procedures that weren't followed. Someone came by, turned on the thing, and the worker was subsequently crushed. Um, they had actually had a, a, a wife and two kids and a baby on the way. So that's, it's, uh, it, gets, it hits home, you know. Um, and then also the, uh, the bailers may not have appropriate interlock guarding um, to ensure that the enclosed chamber or point of operation are completely closed. Um, the issue with this, there was a 16 year old working in a supermarket. Um, he was operating a baler. Um, he, he basically overrode the, some of the, uh, the interlocks and was killed. He was actually found by an exterminator who went down in the basement to, ex to exterminate. Um, and he was crushed. Um, some of the issues with this are to ensure that all the safety devices on belling machines are functioning correctly and uh, you guys as the EHS personnel uh, supervisors, you guys are responsible to make sure that your employees are properly trained to ensure that they are not um, overriding the, the systems that you guys have put in place for, for this reason. Um, as I said, ensure that everyone, including the, especially the employees, understand um, the importance of why the machine has safety features. Um, there's always reason for that. Um, with this one, it was a 16-year-old operating the bailing equipment. Um, that's, that, in, that involves the child labor laws where individuals doing that uh, have to be of age 18. Um, so you kind of want to make sure that you kind of understand the labor laws when it comes to um, having certain people do certain uh, jobs with, within your facilities. And uh, you should always have a, a safety program that includes the training and safe operation of, of all your equipment um, to ensure that everyone understands the, the safety overrides you guys have in place, the safety procedures, the guarding, and so everyone understands why it's there. So for drill presses, um, the drill and the chuck itself should be protected from, uh, from swarf, which is the, you know, the, when you're drilling into metal or wood, you know, the, the part pieces that come up from that. 
Um, that's what SWARF is. Um, when I first started, I had to look it up because I didn't know what it was. Um, and then at this point, because of the up and down motion, it becomes a little more difficult. However, they make telescoping shielding um, that can be used to, to cover this. It's something you have to look at your own personal drill presses along with different guarding and figure out what works best for, for, your, uh, for your facility. Um, these right here are some pictures of some, some examples of how, to, of how you would look at guarding um, drill presses. Drill presses and iron, iron workers. Um, the barrier guards within the iron workers and presses, they have to be to the point where it does not allow um, hands or fingers into the point of operation by reaching through, over, under, or around the guard itself. They need to prevent the worker from being able to access that point of operation. Um, and within the uh, table, within 217 of the 1910, if anyone has any questions on any of that stuff, get with me after the presentation. I'll kind of show you kind of what I'm talking about. Um, but the guard must conform to the, the openings in, in that table. Um, the barrier guard itself should also not create a pinch point, so the guard can't create a, a hazardous point for the, uh, for the operator themselves. And uh, it shouldn't be easily removable. You can't you know, stick it up there with you know, a piece of gum or something like that and say, oh, it's guarded, because at that point the worker can remove it and they can access that point of operation. Um, and it shouldn't interfere with machine inspection. The worker should still be able to see what's going on with, within the, the operation um, and kind of understand uh, you know, what's going on. And, uh, and yeah, so your two hand controls for, uh, for presses and whatnot, um, they're basically there to prevent unintended operation of the, uh, of the system. Um, and then anytime you're going to have a steel press or anything like that, using more than one operator, you need to have the two hand controls for both operators, which you know, prevents one employee from, being able to operate, from getting in that point of operation while the other one has actuated the machine. So the attachments for the, uh, this looks like an example of like some of the, maybe some of the pullback um, type of devices. But it should be adjusted to prevent the operator from reaching into the point of operation or to withdraw a operator's hand from the point of operation before the die is closed. So basically what you want to do is, as the die is coming down, there's a connection that pulls your hands back as the die is coming down to keep your hands out of, that, uh, out of that point of operation. We'll cover that a little more in detail here in just a few minutes. Um, a separate, and as I said before, with, uh, if you're having two operators, um, you need to have a separate pull-out device for each individual operator working on that particular machine. And then uh, each device must be inspected and checked at the start of each shift. Reason being, if I have a machine and then uh, I, I follow behind a person who's six foot six, um, obviously I'm going I'm to be able to reach into the point of operation and the pullback feature won't work. So you need to make sure that it's inspected for each operator at the beginning of each shift. And then uh, obviously keep uh, inspection and maintenance records. And uh, as the employer, it would be your responsibility to make the periodic and regular safety inspections on that, on that machinery. Um, your point of operation guard shall prevent the entry of hands and fingers into the point of operation by reaching over through or under the guard, and as well as uh, must conform to the maximum initial openings in, of table 010, which again is in the 1910. And if anyone has any question on that, again, see me after the, uh, my little spiel, and I'll kind of co help cover that for you. Um, this is what I was talking about the pullback. Um, what this does is as the die comes down, um, it looks like this may not be, have been adjusted properly. It looks like hands a little too far in there, but as this goes down, it'll actually pull his hands out of the way so that if it's worn, if worn and adjusted properly, it'll prevent his hands from being in the point of operation um, while the uh, die is closed. Um, these are kind of some, some examples of uh, possible pullback features that you may see or may look into or may even have in your operation. Um, present sensing devices are, uh, are good. Um, however, they cannot be used on machines with a full revolution clutch. Um, I don't know how familiar you are with full revolution clutches, but on some items, once they're actuated, there's no stopping it. Therefore, if you have that on a present sensing device, if this is full revolution, as it's coming down, if you break that, if you can't stop it, then the present sensing device does absolutely no good. Um, so, if you have a machine with a full revolution, um, a present sensing device does you no good. Um, and they can't be used as a tripping, method, tripping means to initiate any kind of slide motion. Um, this is an example of why you can't use present sensing devices on full revolution clutches, because they don't work. Um, going back into hand feeding tools we talked about a little bit earlier, um, they're intended for handling the equipment. They're not intended to be a guard. Um, 
as I said earlier, you can't use them in lieu of a guard. They can be used as a supplement to guarding. Um, some different examples of uh, hand tools that you may see in your operation. Um, if you have any of the, uh, the foot actuated um, pedals, they need to be covered by the U-shaped metal guard and fastened to the floor. Um, one thing I've seen a lot with these is people will take these and not necessarily the employer, the employer will be the employee you know, who has a faster way of doing something. They'll take them up, put them on their table or their workstation and teaches, they say it's easier for them to use their hands for them. Um, that's part of the training that you have to provide your employees and then make them understand that that's not the way the manufacturer intended it and there's a reason why it's actuated by the foot and not the hand. Um, so that would be on basically training, making sure the employee understands it. This next part we're going to go into kind of covers the uh, flywheels, pulleys, belts, ropes, chains, that kind of stuff, all the, basically anything that can spin. Um, that's an example of a, an old piston flywheel. Um, hopefully you all don't have any of that in your facilities. It's a little bit older equipment. Um, but any flywheels um, that are seven feet or less above the ground have to be guarded. Um, if your flywheel is at seven foot six inches, but even part of it extends below that seven foot mark, um, then that part needs to be guarded. So if you guys have anything above seven feet, um, then you would not fall into this criteria. Um, it needs to be guarded with a sheet, perforated or expanded metal or woven wire, or by guard rails between 15 to 20 inches from the flywheel rim. Um, so you, shouldn't have, you should have a guard that prevents any kind of access to that flywheel while in operation. Um, and if, if the tow board is over any kind of like pit or any kind of drop, where that's at needs to have tow boards to prevent any kind of uh, material from falling down into that, into that pit. And then any kind of projections uh, shall be covered as well. Um, as I said earlier, any kind of uh, shaft or anything like that, seven feet or less above the floor, um, need, needs to be uh, effectively guarded. Um, troughs must enclose sides and top or sides and bottom of shafting um, as your location requires. If you guys have anything like that, um, let me know and we'll, we'll take a look at it and we'll kind of decide if what you have is effective. If it's not, we'll kind of point you in the right direction. Um, I haven't seen any kind of troughs yet, so I'd have to look it up for you. I'm not going to give you guys any you know, made up answer. I'd rather look it up before I give you all false information. Um, same with pulleys. If, they are, if any parts of them are seven feet or less from the floor, um, they, once again, need to be guarded. Seven foot's kind of your, uh, your, your key distance to kind of remember when, when it comes to guarding. Um, they looked at it and said basically anything seven feet or below um, is accessible to an employee. So that's kind of where the, they got that, that number from. Um, and then pulley serving as a balance wheel, such as like punch presses, where the point of contact between the belt and pulley is more than six feet, six inches from the floor platform may be guarded with a disc covering the spokes. Um, I haven't seen this issue. Um, everything I've seen has just been um, standard guarding. If you guys have anything like that, I'd actually like to see it. So if you guys have a picture, just go ahead and send it to me if you can. Um, I'll take any information. So this right here is where I was talking about earlier, where I can give you kind of an example of, of a pinch point. What it would be is if this machinery is running this, this direction, right here where this runs in, this right here is where your nip point would be, and that would be the part that has to be guarded. Um, if anyone had any questions on, on that kind of issue. Um, this is something right here where a guide must be placed in the area if the pulley itself has the ability to come out. Um, what that's basically saying is that if the belt width is two inches and your distance is more than that, such as for instance, this example, three inches, you need to have a guide there to prevent that uh, one of the uh, belts from being able to, to come off of that pulley. Um, this is kind of what's covering the seven foot mark. You can see right here at seven feet, there's part of a pulley system. Um, that, is, that would have to be effectively covered. Anything above that um, is considered good to go. Um, you don't have to provide um, any guarding for that. If you wanted to, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, we kind of push a best practice mentality. If you can make something better than it is, why not do it? So your gear, sprockets, and chains should be guarded by any of the following methods. Um, by providing it with a complete enclosure or by a standard guard, as in paragraph O, which is, like I said, it's in the 1910. If you have any questions, get with me. Um, anything at least seven feet high, extending six inches above the mesh point of the gears. Um, and then all guards should be rigidly braced every three feet or a fractional part of their height to some fixed point or machinery or building structure. Um, if you can, it's probably best practice to be able to get the guard directly on the machine itself. Uh, most manufacturers 
They may not sell the guard with the machine itself, but they have points to where that you can should be able to uh, to mount or fasten one of your uh, guards effectively to it. Um, and then again, where guard is exposed to contact with any moving equipment, additional strength may be necessary. Um, I haven't seen it to where um, to where moving machinery comes into contact with anything else. Um, but if you guys have that in your facility, that may be something to look at. Where a standard guard may not be enough, you may need to brace that for the uh, repetitive um, contact. Um, so something I've seen a lot of sites, uh, especially on machinery, is that um, a, a lot of manufacturers seem to put um, OSHA approved on their machinery or on their guarding. Um, that's a common misconception. Um, OSHA is not an approving authority. Um, OSHA nor the Department of Labor, we, we don't approve anything. Um, so if you just have machinery or equipment that says OSHA approved or OSHA certified, that doesn't mean that OSHA approves or OSHA certified. That that's, that's not the case. Um, the machine they build, it may meet the specifications of an OSHA regulation or a Virginia regulation, but um, OSHA and the Department of Labor is not a, uh, an, approving, an approval authority for machinery or guarding. Um, with that, let's see here, got a few minutes. Um, if anyone has any questions on any of this information or would, uh, or would like to cover um, anything we do with consultation, if you have a business with less than 250 employees, um, I'd love to be able to, be able to sit down and talk to you for a minute and kind of tell you what, what we can do for your, uh, for your company. Um, so if anyone has any questions, we'll answer that. If not, we'll, this will take a few. Yes, ma'am. Uh, on the foot pedals, all foot pedals need to be secured to the floor. If the manufacturer has designed them to be secured to the floor, um, they, they need to be in place as the manufacturer has designed or specified. Um, that, that's what we, we have the, what's called the Administrative Regulations Manual. Um, I don't know if any of you all are aware of that, but any machinery that's being used, it has to be used, maintained, and uh, installed within the manufacturer's specifications. Um, if you're following how the manufacturer designed that to be, most, most of the foot pedals are designed to be uh, anchored to the floor. Um, if, if that's how they were designed, then that's how they need to be used in operation. Okay, if you, if you have a foot pedal and say you have a machine, and you added a two-head two control, and you also have foot pedal for guarding to make it safer. Um, how do you know if the manufacturer, and some of the foot pedals we have are older and some of them are new, and, um, <coughs> and I go back and I look at those, how can I tell if it's manufacturing chance for those to be anchored to the floor? Um, do, I, don't, I don't know if you're going to, do you guys have any kind of like, um, uh, pamphlet or operator's manual for any of the machines you have. I know a lot of the machines are older. Some of these didn't come with the machine. If they come with the machine, uh, of course they'll tell you, but some of these we've added to the machine. It's like a, a press or something like that where it's got a two-palm control. Right, and, and, and you guys add, add, the, 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 add the foot pedal to it? Foot control because then you got your hands here, you got one foot on you got to have all of them for it to operate. Right. Um, with that, I would go back to the whoever manufactured the foot pedal itself and find out from them um, if not, um, it may, may need to look into getting like a, uh, uh, what do you call them, one of the, uh, an engineer or something like that to look at it to see how it, it, it was intended to be used. Most foot pedals I would, that I've seen do say that it should, should, should be, be mounted to the floor. Because um, a lot of companies, what I've seen is a lot of employees will take them off the floor and put them on the table. Because at that point it, it's easier to use. I, I don't see how. I think it's easier to use the, that, that's just me though. Yeah. We never had their problem, but is your recommendation that they should be anchored? I, I would say so most, because okay. they, they, they were designed for floor use. So I would assume, which with, without, obviously without re-reading into it, I would assume that the manufacturer has designed that to be used okay. by, by foot. Well, yes, all of ours are designed. Right. And I haven't seen any on top of the table or anything, but uh, so we do have some that are not, are not anchored. I do know that. Um, so I could check. Yeah, I would give it the manufacturer. They, they, they should be able to give you a little better information than I could. I don't know um, what they have designed that specifically for. Okay. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Um, anybody else have any questions or any information? Or, um, also on the side table, um, Chris actually has them. Um, this right here came from an OSHA safety uh, stand down. It's, okay, um, if you guys want this or haven't got them yet, um, it actually covers some good information about um, machine guarding. Um, it goes into the different kinds of training, potential PPE, um, the hazards that may come with it, the electric hazards, and any kind of requirements. Um, if anybody would like one of these, raise your hand, Chris will get them to you. 
Um, it's kind of good to go off of. Did I hear my name? Yes, ma'am. Oh, give yeah, this one. Sorry. That's okay. Thank you. Those were on the table. Did, did you want as well, sir? I think Chris, Chris, Chris got them all. Yeah. Um, also, if anybody is interested in uh, in talking to me about what consultation can kind of do for your company, um, let me know. I can kind of pass out my little um, marketing campaign that I wrote up. Um, but if, if you guys are interested, that's awesome. If not, um, you guys should be pay, paying for the service. Might as well use it if you have less than 250 employees. That's for um, yeah, I, I wouldn't. If, if, if it's it's two, 250 corporate wide, correct? Yeah. If, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. If it's, you guys are over that, I can't really do a whole lot for you. But um, if you guys go less than that, um, I'd be more than happy to kind of help you out. We've had a lot of going into a lot of facilities that are well below OSHA, um, what OSHA and Virginia requires, and we, we've done done a lot for them and at a, at no cost to them. So. Oh, perfect. Yes, sir. I actually have a question. Okay. Uh, oh, the right. question is, are there any exemptions for, say, if you're a car that installed in uh, mechanical spaces that are restricted to authorized personnel that work on the equipment itself, would you consider that room be the guarding for other folks or...? If that is part of your lockout tagout procedure right. that prevents access to that um, when it is not... <coughs> Because no, no one should be accessing that unless the machine, the equipment is locked out, correct? No, only for authorized personnel. Is is the stuff inside that room unguarded? Some parts may be exposed. Yeah. If but if that's the way they, if employees are exposed to the hazard while it's in operation, then it, it would need need to be guarded. So employees include everyone. Yes, sir. Yeah, because the authorized employee, they're, they're they're still an employee whether the company authorizes them or not. So you'd have to protect them.